Very good. Well, good morning, after, good morning, Pentagon Press. I know you've recently heard from General Townsend, but given the ongoing operations to liberate Mosul, we're temporarily increasing our briefing battle rhythm to offer new developments. First, the ongoing operations to liberate Mosul. Iraqi and Kurdish security forces have continued progress in clearing their respective axes from Daesh and are back clearing several areas before they continue to advance. As they do so, the coalition will continue our precision strikes to take out Daesh targets. For example, many of you have seen and noted the enemy has developed extensive tunneling networks in some of the areas that they use for tactical movement and to hide weapons if left unabated this could present challenges for the Iraqi and Peshmerga forces advancing on the city, potentially enabling the enemy to pop up along their flanks or even behind them. Coalition strikes have taken out 46 of those tunnels since the liberation battle for Mosul started on October 17th, reducing the threat from a favored enemy tactic. One of the highest profile tactics the enemy has used since the Battle of Mosul started has been their lighting of the toxic sulfur residue stored at al-Mishrak, south of Mosul. The latest information I have is that those fires are, likely, are, are largely under control, but continue smoldering and flaring up as the Iraqis continue to use water, sand, and firefighting foam to combat the blaze. Coalitions constantly assessing the risk to forces at Camp Swift and Kara West airfield due to the smoke caused from the burning wells and from the sulfur plant fire and the masks that have been required at those locations, uh, they've not been required for the past two days. Dash is intent on st Dash's intent in starting those fires was to divert and disrupt ISF forces who are going to Mosul, and those efforts have failed. Since the campaign for Mosul started, the coalition has delivered almost 2,500 close air support bombs and missiles, artillery rounds and high Mars rockets on enemy targets since the battle started on October 17th. Those weapons destroyed not only the tunnels we already discussed, but 33 vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices and hundreds of enemy vehicles, fighting positions, and artillery pieces. Finally, in case you missed it, the airfield at Kara West is now open, and the first flight landed there blacked out in the evening of October 21st, the new airfield capability provides the coalition and the Iraqis who have their own C-130s the ability to resupply or reposition forces rapidly. Daesh had largely destroyed that airfield in a manner they thought would deny the ISF and the coalition from using it. The Iraqi and coalition forces who swept the area to remove explosives, plus 29 airmen who specialize in opening and repairing airfields, used their heavy equipment and more than two million pounds of concrete to show Dash once again that they are wrong. Five flights have gone into that airfield so far. Pentagon Press, I would be delighted to take your questions. Sure. I'll start with the, uh, the incident uh, on the 17th. Uh, from my understanding, and I, I'm catching up with this uh, a little bit late as you are, um, two aircraft, one Russian and one uh, coalition, came within about a half a mile of each other. Uh, the the uh, Russian aircraft was a, a, a fighter jet, uh, and the coalition aircraft was a, a larger uh, framed aircraft. Uh, that we don't uh, provide additional detail on. Uh, but uh, the flight, uh, the jet, the Russian jet uh, passed in front of the coalition jet close enough uh, that the jet wash from that flight uh, was felt within the larger aircraft. So that's closer than we'd like. Um, there was an immediate uh, contact between the aircraft and then follow-up 
through the deconfliction channel that we've been working with the Russians for quite some time. Uh, the coalition, the CAOC, uh, does, uh, does not assess this to be something that was done with nefarious intent, uh, and therefore um, they've continued discussing that incident and those deconfliction calls, uh, they continue to be conducted on a daily basis. The latest one was today at about 11 o'clock. Uh, General Townsend was informed when this event occurred, um, so he was aware of this as well. And that's about the level of information that I have for you, Bob. Um, regarding the human shields, we have seen many instances in the past where Dash have used human shields in order to try and fil facilitate their escape. Um, right now, they're using human shields to make the Iraqi and security force advance uh, more difficult. Uh, we uh, don't have quite as specific of information as I've seen in some of the news reports today, uh, but we did expect them to do some of this type of uh, taking of human shields. Uh, because they've done it in previous liberation battles, most recently and I guess most famously in Manbij, uh, where they kidnapped you know, up to a couple of thousand people in, in their escape convoy. So this is something that we've seen. Uh, we did expect them to do some of this, and what's happening is as they fall back into the city, apparently they are taking some uh, of the local residents as human shields. So this is something that we try to uh, stop when we can or put, put a stop to it. Uh, I am aware of uh, one incident uh, in which uh, Dash had gathered a large number of vehicles uh, to try and transport some of the civilians back with them. Uh, we were able to attack those vehicles before they could take the civilians. So I... Uh, yeah, I, I don't have the specifics on the date and the location of that strike. Uh, we can owe that to you. Uh, I was gathering information on that this afternoon. Well, it wasn't reported to the public because we have a deconfliction channel to discuss these incidents with the Russians. Uh, the deconfliction channel is not one that's necessarily designed uh, for public disclosure, and really the, uh, the purpose of that is to do the exact opposite of uh, turning it into a bit major incident. It's really more intended to keep the temperature down between us and the Russians in that very crowded and confused, uh, at times, battle space. So that's why we didn't put it out then. Uh, shortly thereafter, and there were communications between the two aircraft, and it was followed up uh, I believe the next day uh, with the Russians in the normal channel. Uh, for the uh, October 17th incident, I don't know if they had conducted a deconfliction call that day. We'll take that question and get with the CAOC and try to get it answered for you. Um, so uh, we'll have to get back to you on that one. With regard to the, uh, the human shields, uh, we don't have uh, good fidelity. I think it would be a little bit of a wag uh, for me at this point. I, I just don't think it would be appropriate for me to offer a number because... Uh, we just don't have that level of fidelity at this point.
Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, on that incident, it was more than a couple of vehicles. My understanding uh, from the discussions I've had was that they had massed about 50 vehicles, and the strike was able to take out 40 to 45 of them. So it's a pretty significant strike. Uh, I'm not aware of any other incident in which something like this happened, um, but uh, we, can, uh, we can look into that. And that's one of the open questions that I had this afternoon when I learned of uh, the larger strike. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, first off, now you do know. And uh, there wasn't anybody playing I Got a Secret. It had nothing to do with that. Uh, that's why this was used as an example. Uh, the purpose of uh, the discussion at the CAOC, my understanding, was to discuss the importance of the deconfliction channel. And this was provided as an example in those discussions. So uh, I don't think that uh, it was perceived to be uh, a danger. And again, we don't assess that this was the Russians uh, trying to do anything with nefarious intent. But this is an exp you know, the explanation for it is uh, why uh, it's important to have these deconfliction measures. So if there's something that could put pilots in danger, that there's an opportunity to discuss it between the two sides and create processes and procedures and enough transparency to deconflict. So uh, that's the explanation for it. As far as uh, General Townsend, uh, you know, he was briefed on this incident. Uh, I don't think that uh, he saw it as uh, anything that, that needed to go out in a breaking news event. Uh, he understands that the purpose of this deconfliction channel is to discuss these things with the Russians, and that's, uh, that's exactly how it played out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, what I said is we don't believe there was any nefarious intent. So that's, that's, uh, that's all on that. Um, as far as near misses and how many there have been in the past, I'd have to circle back with the CAOC and we'll have to owe you that answer. Uh, I'm not aware of any such incident. Uh, um, 
other than this one. Um, and we'll just throw that to you. I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit. I couldn't, couldn't hear what you said. Well, I think it's a significant enough incident that it required follow-up in this briefing, uh, in this deconfliction channel. Uh, we don't like to fly our aircraft within a half a mile of each other. I can assure you of that. Um, but uh, as far as the level of danger, um, you know, it's no one declared an in-flight emergency or anything of that nature. Um, and uh, again, we just followed it up afterwards and. Uh, you know, start, continue those deconfliction efforts. Well, Tara, it, it, uh, it jives just fine with what I told you. I said I'm not aware of any other such incidents and haven't been briefed on any. So it sounds like you've got some additional information. Um, so good for you. Um, Um, this is the first time I've been informed of any such thing. So that's all the information I have for you. I think uh, it's clear to me that you're interested in learning more about this and if there are any further incidents. So we'll follow that up with the CAOC and get you some more information, but I just don't have any, others, any other information to offer about that. What, uh, what, what I can tell you is that uh, the Iraqis uh, are an adaptive force, and so what they've seen is some tactics, techniques, and procedures by Daesh that uh, have led them to believe it's in their interest to pause the advance uh, in some areas in order to do some back clearing and make sure that uh, their flanks and their, their uh, uh, rear are clear of Daesh. Um, but, uh, you know, they're still largely on plan and uh, on the various axes of advance anywhere from 10 to 20 kilometers away. Um, that's uh, that's kind of where it stands right now. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're following their agreement. Uh, they're executing the plan that they've come up with uh, the Iraqis, uh, between the Iraqis and the Kurdish re regional government. Uh, there's been very good cooperation between the two sides, and um, everyone's honored the agreements that they, uh, they entered into.
Yeah, I, uh, I haven't seen those reports, um, so we'll just have to look into that for you. But, um, you know, uh, everything that I have seen indicates to me that uh, the Kurds are following the agreed-upon plan, uh, and they're doing what the Iraqis uh, and they agreed to. Well, we, we have seen a lot of open source reports, and there have been incidents uh, that our intelligence enterprise has seen. Uh, we've not seen the very large numbers that it, we've seen in some of the reports, but uh, we are comparing the things that we've uh, seen from talking to sources on the ground, SIGINT, and other intelligence sources, and just deconflicting those to determine uh, the size and scope of the, uh, the issue. Well, we're supportive of the, the, uh, the plan that the government of Iraq has come up with. So um, my understanding is that that plan includes the popular mobilization forces uh, moving into those areas. Um, we'll support uh, forces that are uh, under the command and control of the Iraqi government in doing the things that the Iraqi government has asked them to do. No, Bob, we expected that there would be instances where they needed to pause and reposition forces, you know, because the enemy gets a vote. Uh, the Iraqis have made the determination that now is the time to do that, and we've continued to conduct strikes in support of them to go against tunnels, uh, the command and control network for Daesh, uh, but they, they have uh, decided to do some back clearing, and that, uh, that's not uh, something that we would consider to be off plan. I think they're still largely on plan and, you know, they continue to push. And after, uh, you know, a couple days of refit, resupply, uh, repositioning, I think that they'll be uh, moving forward again. Well, we, we have uh, been working with the Iraqi security forces and government of Iraq for quite some time uh, on their plan for post-Mosul. So we've uh, trained a very large number of security uh, police forces because these are going to be key to uh, establishing a degree of stability in the areas 
that get uh, liberated from Daesh. So we think the police are going to go in as a part of the hold force and the wide area security force once Daesh have been pushed out of the city. Uh, and then they'll move into a lot of the other areas, and this is a part of the answer for counterinsurgency because, as you know, the police uh, in their regular presence and regular interaction with the population, that is uh, the purpose of those forces, and uh, that, that's the answer for how you solve a problem with counterinsurgency or terrorist tactics. So uh, Daesh won't be allowed to simply melt away uh, and then do terrorist attacks or sort of counterinsurgency ops, uh, the uh, police will be in these areas and assisting with that challenge. Uh, there is a plan in place, but it's an adaptive plan, and it's, you know, they continue to work on this. Uh, I think what we have to do is get uh, Mosul cleared of Daesh, and once we do that, we'll see where those remaining elements are. I think there are some in Tel Afar, there are some in Al Qaim, there are some along the Euphrates River Valley, and then there are other areas where they'll try to infiltrate. And we'll get a, a feel for the size and scope of the challenge that there is. And a lot of the forces that we've trained up until now uh, will be repositioned to address that. That's exactly right, Tom. Uh, it, is, uh, it is widespread. Uh, it's, you know, forces uh, on several axes. Uh, they're, they're pausing and repositioning, refitting, and doing some back clearing. Uh, we think it'll just be a couple days, and they'll be back on the march toward Mosul. Um, yeah, that's, that's their game plan, and uh, we believe they're going to be able to stick to it. No, I, I would say that uh, what the definition of on schedule is, they have a plan for how far they want to get uh, each day, and they were able to get to those places faster than they anticipated that they would. So uh, the Iraqis continue uh, to be successful in the engagements against Daesh, uh, and, you know, essentially uh, they are on plan, and, uh, you know, ready to move back toward Mosul probably within the next couple of days. Yeah, a lot of it is uh, just uh, repositioning forces as we get a feel for where areas of uh, extra uh, dash presence, very tougher, you know, tougher areas. Uh, the Iraqis may reposition forces in order to sort that out, and we share our intelligence with them so that they can determine where they want to advance and with what force. And then we'll uh, continue to assess the situation and conduct strikes in support of the advance once they start moving forward again. So that's, uh, that's kind of where we are. Um, really, uh, what I would say is, uh, you know, the, uh, 
uh, the Iraqis uh, are, you know, quite capable of uh, defeating Daesh. They've pushed them out of uh, all these key areas around Mosul, um, and they continue to, to uh, reposition uh, as they see fit. And when I was discussing this with uh, my counterpart, General Tashin, the other day with a couple of our uh, press who were visiting, what he said is that uh, one of their primary uh, goals is the protection of civilian life. So uh, they are assessing the same news reports that you all are assessing and making the determination how best to get after those issues. Yeah, we can take a look and see how many uh, square kilometers have been recaptured. I, I don't have that figure handy here, but uh, I think we can probably get that for you. Yeah, my, uh, my uh, information is there were anywhere from 60 to 100, uh, and you can get a lot done with 60 to 100 determined fighters. Uh, we uh, do assess them to have been a dangerous force. Obviously, they were able to take temporary control of some of the government buildings and go into the center of the city and cause some significant mayhem with the, uh, the local populace there. The Iraqi security forces uh, did expect a lot of these kinds of attacks, and they positioned their forces around the country uh, in order to respond to those. Uh, we had seen some significant uh, spoiler-type attacks and harassing attacks around Rupa, so this was not a, a real surprise for the Iraqis, and they were very, uh, very much uh, uh, capable and moved. Uh, the forces that they had nearby into the city and uh, were able to take it back uh, within about 36 hours or so. They were pretty much uh, had everything pacified. Uh, most of them were killed in, in place. Uh, some of them were trying to escape the, si the city uh, and were struck by coalition air strikes. Um, so, you know, probably uh, somewhere around a, a third to a half of them. Uh, so that's, uh, that's about it. Um, I don't know, Lou. You will, you'll have to follow that one up with CENTCOM. Thank you.